Welcome, Crossing family. I wish I could be with you this weekend, but I'm preaching at our first Uncommon Conference in Florida. It would not be back in time for our Thursday services. And that means I need to find someone to help us on our 50-50 journey, which I hope you're still on. I'd like to introduce you to Nate Ross. Nate Ross is the founder of Moments to Movements. His passion is connecting leaders like you to the creator, helping you break through your growth barriers so that you can thrive in your unique calling. Having grown up in a pastor's home that served in churches ranging from the Midwest all the way to Las Vegas, he's had some unique opportunities to learn from some incredible leaders. Nate has served as a guidance counselor for a Christian university on boards of global nonprofits and at his local church in almost every role imaginable. Most recently, he served as a lead pastor in a church of over 6,000 people that was twice named one of the top 100 fastest growing churches in America. On top of all of that, He's my friend and a world-class encourager. Would you please give Nate Ross a warm crossing welcome? Get him, Nate. Amen. Boy, crossing family, what an honor to be with you and every campus want to welcome you. And uh, I met Clayton, your pastor, 23 years ago when I was his camp counselor at church camp. And he was a scrawny little kid. And uh, no, actually, he dominated all of his counselors in basketball. Uh, but 23 years ago, I met him and we formed this friendship. And it was one, it's just been one of these joys of journeying. Uh, and here's the thing. I, I'm not really a spiritual father. I, I'm just a spiritual brother uh, to him. And uh, he's my big brother, right? Because Clayton's everybody's big brother, right? And, uh, but I love this church and I love what God is doing. And uh, if this is your first time or if it is your first time in a long time, I want to welcome you. Uh, this is my first time in a long time. I was here in August for your Uncommon Conference. Anybody here? Any men in here in this room? Show hands in your campus here. Any women try to break into that conference, right? You know, I mean, it is a happening deal, and uh, it was great. My, me and my dad got to be here, and uh, it was a joy. And, and here's what I love. The reason why I'm here really is because God is using this church, the Crossing family, to help change the churches all across our country. Uh, that, that's what was going on. Clayton, you saw it in the video. He was down in Florida as they kicked off their first Uncommon Conference. I grew up in Las Vegas, and so the phrase I grew up with is, what happens in Vegas, what? Stays in Vegas. Here's what I love about the crossing. What happens at the crossing doesn't stay at the crossing, right? I love this about the crossing. You guys are going, we're not just about here. We are about God's kingdom. This is the invitation that you have. Maybe you came in today, or maybe this is your thought. You're like, you know what? We're in the tri-state area. We're not really Chicago. We're not really Kansas City. We're not really St. Louis. We're just us. And can I just let you know today, you being you is enough because here's what changes us. We don't change ourselves. It is the kingdom of God that changes us. It is the kingdom of God that floods into our life. And God says, I want to use the tri-state area to change this country. That's the invitation for you and I today. That's why we talk about this series, 50 for 50, because this is God's invitation for you. He's going, I want to meet you right where you are. And I want to change you from the inside out. And I don't want to just change you. I want to change the community around you. And I want to invite you, if you haven't picked up one of these, it's just $10 out in the lobby. I've been following along the last two weeks. Clayton's sermon, if you didn't get to check it out last weekend on the Word of God, is phenomenal. But what happens is this, God begins to change our life the more we make His Word and His ways our priority. Matter of fact, some of you are going, you know what, I, I have been looking for more. And this is what I love. This is what I love that happens in the world. It's this. We want more in this church. We want more to go, God, we want you to do more in our life. That's what this series is all about. But can I just let you know, this is what I found out. Crossing family, it's not just you that wants more. Here's what I found out. 15 million more people want more in this world. Did you know that? You're like, well, how'd you do that? Uh, because I read what is the number one best-selling book on Amazon right now. And you know what the number one best-selling book on Amazon is right now? It's this book right here. It's called Atomic Habits. The number one book right now in the world is this. It's Atomic Habits. And 15 million people, it was the number one book back in 2021. It's the number one book again right now. And what the world is saying by buying this book is this. I need more and I don't have what I'm looking for. But I want more in my life. You may be here today going, this can't be it. 
And what I love is this. I love when authors stumble upon this idea that they're like, scientifically, we've proven it. And God's like, oh, you did? Oh, that's so neat. Like these rhythms just showed up in the 21st century. Like they've never been here before. And I love James Clear. I don't know his faith journey, but I love his tagline. He says this, tiny changes, remarkable results. What an idea if you and I begin to make just some tiny changes in our life. And we watch God do the remarkable. You know, this whole series talking about 50 for 50, it's about going pro. And today I want to talk about going pro. And this is the big idea I just want to communicate. If you have your book, you want to write this down. It's just simply this. And this is what we're going to look at is this. Jesus is the more that you and I are looking for. Jesus is the more. We're looking everywhere to make our marriage better. We're looking everywhere to make our job better. We're trying to get better at all these different things, but Jesus is the more that we're looking for. Here's what I love that James Clear says in his book. It's this, I don't know about you, but I grew up, uh, you know, we talk about creating these new habits. I always heard this idea that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. I couldn't even make it to day three, so I just give up, right? How many people, you just don't even make a New Year's resolution. You're like, I don't feel guilty, right? If you don't make one, you don't feel guilty, right? Like that, that's, that, that's a little bit of my mantra, but here's the thing. James Clear says this, I I love it. He says, actually, it's not 21 days. I'll play a little prices right with you. He did some research. Can anybody guess how long he he says it takes nowadays to form a new habit? Anybody? Throw a number out. 47? Someone said $1, Bob, right? You know what I'm saying? Right? Here's what James says. James says now with all sorts of scientific research, he says it takes 66 days to create a new habit. See, this is why God says, if you want to change, you've got to show up every day into my word. And he uses this phrase in that book, and this is what all this is about. It says he calls it habit stacking. Last week, Clayton talked about stacking our life on the word of God and obedience out of that. Today, I want to look at two disciplines that Jesus did. Because what happens is when you and I go pro, here's the thing. The game is going to change. And Jesus is the game changer. I want us to look at Mark chapter 12. This is the verse that this whole series is built on. And what's amazing about this verse in Mark chapter 12, it's this, Jesus changed the game. This is from Deuteronomy chapter six, except Jesus starts adding things to the scriptures. Now here's the deal. You and I don't get to change scripture, but guess who gets to change scripture? Jesus does, right? Jesus is the one that changes. And this is what he says in Mark chapter 12. A a law keeper, a a Pharisee came to him and they tried to trick Jesus. Just heads up real quick. If you're going to get in a theological argument with Jesus, you're going to lose, right? And listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 12. He asked him, what is the greatest thing that we could give our life to? He says, here it is, the greatest law out of all 613 laws. It's this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. What's interesting is this. Jesus adds this word from Deuteronomy chapter six. It's not in Deuteronomy chapter six, but this is what he knows. If your life is gonna change, your mind is gonna need to change. And with all of your strength. The second is this. He takes Leviticus and adds a verse to it. This, he says, the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself, and there is no commandment greater than these. The whole series is based on this. That if you want to go pro, you go pro based on commitments because amateurs live by feelings. Some of you, you're going, you know what? I don't know how God feels about me right now. Or you know how you feel about God. And you and God right now, I got a good friend right now. He's in an argument with God. And there's all sorts of feelings going on in his life. Some of you, you're going, this is what I feel about my neighbor. Some of you are here today and you don't even like yourself And Jesus says, it's the love of God that begins to change us and move us forward. Well, how do we do that? I want to look at two practices today that you're going to find in your booklet. And here's the thing. They are not what you think that changes us. This is the ways of Jesus. It's not always the way we think. Matter of fact, the more I studied the the, the ways of Jesus, here's what I found out. Here's how Jesus stayed in relationship with his father. There's three things he did. This is how he went pro. It was through three things, and it's what we do. It's this. He practiced his spiritual gifts. You were made with spiritual gifts. When you get baptized, when you allow the Holy Spirit to come into you, he gifts you to be a blessing. 
You have gifts. You have a calling on your life. Jesus lived according to his spiritual gifts. Here's the other thing. He practiced spiritual disciplines. We're going to talk about two of them today. And then the third thing is this. He obeyed the promptings of the Holy Spirit in his life. Now you're looking at it going, well, I can do that. I know. Here's the good news. Jesus wants you to go pro today. He's like, I, I, I want you to live by your spiritual gifts. I want you to allow the spiritual disciplines to change your life. And I want you to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So how, how do we go pro? Two things we're going to talk about, two disciplines that Jesus did. It's this. He lived by these, these disciplines, fasting and Sabbath. Boy, I was really expecting everybody to stand on their feet and start cheering right there, right? You're like, no food and no work. That's how my life is going to change. Really? That's what I woke up for? It's for you to tell me to go without food and don't work and then everything's going to change. Just show of hands real quick. How many people right now you're like, dude, I just need a day off. You're like, you know, Clayton, you got in at 2.30 this morning, right? And here you are. You're like, you know, maybe one of the most spiritual things you can do is take a nap during the sermon, all right? You have blessing to do that, right? Now, here's the thing. How many of you are like, I don't need a day. I need a vacation right now. You're like, man, I just need a vacation. Now, here's a tip. I'm a parent of three, 11, eight, and six. Do not confuse taking a vacation with going with your kids. You did not take a vacation. You took a trip, right? And when you get back, you will need a vacation from your trip, right? But you didn't, you didn't do a vacation. Now, here's what I know about us in this room. And even if you're not a follower of Jesus, it's this. There is something inside you that goes, man, I need rest. See, that's what the Sabbath is all about. The Sabbath is from God. And, and it's kind of a Jewish term. It's in the Ten Commandments. We'll talk about it in a minute. It's about giving your soul the rest that you need. And fasting it's about the presence of God. There's an epidemic. I was doing some study on this. You know what our leading epidemic is right now in America? And they're saying this is the leading epidemic across the world. Loneliness. How is it that we can be more connected than ever before and be more lonely than ever? Heard someone say it this way. They said, here's what technology has done to us. Technology has made us become private when we're in public. And it's made us become public when we're in private. Could it be that our whole internal framework is messed up and this is why we need fasting and the Sabbath today? We need a fresh presence of God and we don't just need the presence of God, we need the rest of God in us. See, what I was saying is this, Jesus is the more that you and I are looking for, but here's how the more comes in. Less is more. You're like, no, Nate, more is more. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Because you and I are getting all that we can in this world and it's leaving us more broken, confused, frustrated, and angry than ever before. And Jesus invites us into this life. Matter of fact, you see Jesus practicing the spiritual discipline in Matthew chapter four, right after he gets baptized. Here's what the spirit does in his life. Look what it says here in Matthew chapter four. Right after he gets baptized, here's the first thing the spirit did in his life. He said, then Jesus was led by the spirit. There he is being obedient to the spirit. Okay, God, what you have for me, I'm going to do into the desert to be tempted by the devil. I don't have enough time to unpack it, but what, what you're going to find is this. Jesus is the true Israelite. He's going to do what Israel did not do in the 40 years of the wilderness. He's going to be the faithful one. He's going to be the one who doesn't give in to sin. He's going to be the one who's going to complete everything that God has for us. And listen exactly what happens in verse two. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Thank you very much, Matthew. I gotta believe that he was starving, right? After 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, he's hungry. This represents the 40 years of the Israelites. And then listen to what it says in verse three. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You know where Satan attacks Jesus? He attacks his feelings. He attacks his identity. Here's what's going to happen. When you and I keep following Jesus, or if you become a follower of Jesus, here's what you're going to have to do battle with. You're going to have to do battle with the voices that speak into your life. And here's the thing. There can only be one voice that you listen to. Students in here, I love seeing multi-generation in here you know there are voices that are competing for your identity. That's exactly where Satan goes. See, this is why fasting is so important. 
He goes on to say this, verse 4, Then Jesus answered him, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here's what I want us to get today. It's this. Sometimes we think fasting is just about going without food, just doing without stuff. Can I just let you know, fasting is for feasting. Fasting is about you and I feasting on God's word. It's about feasting on the presence of God. I love how Jesus says this in Matthew chapter five. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus says Christianity isn't just about going, oh, hope I didn't cuss this week. Oh, I just cussed. Oh boy. Oh, oh, oh. But, you know, and, and it's just everything's about not messing up. No, Jesus says it is about hungering and thirsting for righteousness, going after the things of God. See, when you would fast in, in, in biblical time where the Israelites would grow up, here's what fasting meant. It meant this, not just that you would go without food, it's that the time it took to prepare the food, if you were gonna make bread, you had to make the dough. Then you had to you know, bake the dough. Then you had to eat the dough, right? It was a whole couple hour long process. And here's the thing, Jesus was saying this, when you would fast, it's not just that you would give up food, it's that you would replace that process with the presence of God. God, I'm not gonna make, I'm not gonna make food. I'm gonna, I'm gonna devour and spend time with you. Uh, yesterday, I, I got to meet a buddy from Jacksonville that I went to Bible college with in Pittsfield, Illinois, the epicenter of Illinois. Shout out Pike County campus, right? And we went to the restaurant there. We're going, I'm, I'm in Pittsfield. I'm like, you know, probably don't have anything to eat, man. We, we rolled into this restaurant uh, called Nucci's. And uh, Bob, I got to meet Bob, the owner. He's from Jersey because everybody leaves Jersey and goes to Pittsfield, Illinois, right? Like that's just what you do. That's your retirement plan, right? And what was amazing is this. We rolled into this little hole in the wall and we come into some of the best Italian food we ever had. Man, it is like hand rolled meatballs, homemade pizza, sauce, like pasta sauce, all this other stuff. Now, here's what was great. I rolled in, I ate, we paid the bill, and we left. I didn't prepare the sauce. I didn't prepare the food. I didn't clean the dishes. I was like, peace, right? Thank you, Bob. But here's the deal. Somebody got up that morning and made that food. And somebody took the time to prepare everything that was going on. And see, during that, when we fast, when you and I take time to fast, here's what we do. We replace all of that process and we take time to say, God, more than anything else in this world, I want your presence. I want your presence. Jesus says this in John chapter four, the disciples are confused about this. See, the ways of Jesus, when you and I go pro, it is not the way that we think. It is not the way that the world tells us to go pro. It is a whole different world. And Jesus, when he meets the woman at the well, the disciples, they come back and Jesus, they go, hey, give him some food. And listen to what Jesus says in John chapter four. He says, hey, listen to them. He says, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And they're like, is there a new cheese here, right? You know, like, like, where, like, where'd you eat, Jesus? And listen to what he says. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Here's what I love about the word will. I don't know about you, but I've asked this question a number of times in my life. What is God's will for my life? What is God's will? You know what that word will means? It means this, the heart of God. You know what Jesus' food was? to feast on the heart of God. God, the most important thing in my life is your heart. And God, I will give up anything. God, I will give up food. I will give up this stuff because I want more than any other pleasure in this world because I know it's not enough. Jesus is, knows this. God, you are the more I'm looking for in this world. My food, he said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. See, here's what happens when we feast on him. He gives us our purpose. He gives us our work. And we talk about going pro. Here's the thing. None of us go pro alone. We only go pro with Jesus. We only go pro feasting on the presence of God. Too many times, this has been my mistake. It's this, I see God work in my life. Thank you, God. And I feast on his goodness. And then this is what I do. Then I try it on my own. I feast and then I forget. It's like when I'd come home from Bible college and I'd try to tell my parents, I'm my own man. Can you please pay my college bill though? And mom, do my laundry. And I need $20 on the way back. But I'm my own man, right? We feast and then we forget. See, going pro is when you and I 
We feast on the presence of God. Two questions for us today. I want to encourage you as you journey through it's this. One, to do an examination of your life this week and recognize and ask yourself the question, what are you feasting on the most in your life? Maybe just ask God that question. God, would you reveal to me, what what am I feasting on the most? Uh, This morning, I'll, I'll get on my iPhone, I don't know about you, I'll get my notification of what I spent my time on on my phone. Every Sunday morning, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes over me. I was like, did I play that much Candy Crush? I didn't think I did, right? You know, like, and, and here's what happens is I begin to see what my time is spent on. This week, I want to invite you to ask that question. God, what am I feasting on in my life? And then here's the second question I want to ask, because sometimes we get really convicted, like, oh, man, I, I'm wasting time. I, I'm, just, you know, I'm just scrolling on social media. I've got all these other things that I'm just wasting my time on. The second question I want you to ask yourself this week is this. We know we talk about fasting is about feasting, but it's this. Do you believe that God would actually want to feast with you? Here's what I know. I never ask anybody to dinner that probably doesn't want to eat dinner with me. We just don't ask them. Because they're like, well, I don't, I don't feel like getting rejected today. Did you know all throughout Scripture, here's the narrative. God telling his people, I'm your God, and I have all that you need. Will you come to the table and meet with me? Psalm 23, one of the most famous psalms that we know, hidden back there beyond how he walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. David says this, and God prepares a table before me in the presence of my what? Anybody remember? My enemies. Did you know that when you and I are facing enemies in our life, Jesus is saying, here's how you're going to navigate this. You come and you feast on my presence. Do you believe that Jesus actually wants to spend time with you? See, this is what begins to change our life. And here's the challenge that you're going to find in this book. I love this. And if you have complaints, don't call me, call Clayton. Right? You know what I'm saying? I didn't write this, right? But, but this is what I love about the challenge of this book. It's this. Here's one of the challenges. We've got two challenges for you this week to go pro. The first one is this, that you would block out a 10 hour window this week where, and I'm gonna encourage you not to do it alone, maybe with your family, maybe with your life group, it's this, that you would spend a 10 hour window fasting from food if you're able. If physically you you need to eat food within that window, by all means do it. But to spend 10 hours this week fasting, giving up food or or along, and I would encourage giving up social media. And here's the deal, make time to feast with Jesus. Make time. Some of you are like, well, Nate, I don't eat breakfast anyway, and I sleep from about 11 till 8. I'm done. I got, all right, hey, if you don't do that, that doesn't count, all right? That doesn't even count, right? I'm talking about giving up the food to say, God, we want you more than we want food. I remember 15 years ago, my wife Ruthie and I, we were in ministry in Bloomington, Illinois. We were doing youth ministry, and uh, I was just feeling released from God from that role. I didn't know what that meant. And there was another opportunity that came up to help another church. And we were praying about it and we felt led to do it. And, but we were wrestling and do we go? We don't want to mess up. We don't want to mess up. And then like a last default idea was this. Let's fast about it. So we committed, my wife and I, we committed to fast a day, not even to talk about it. And then we'll come back together and we'll go, what did God say to you? Here's what he said to me. And so we spent a day fasting and we came back and here's what God told us. It was, it was amazing. He told us the same thing. And this is what we came back. So did he tell you we should go? Yes or no? It's kind of like a love note in second grade. Just circle, yes or no, right? You know, do we go? Do we not go, God? He told us the same thing. Here's what God's answer was to us. I want you to want me more than you want the answer. Yes or no? Do we go? Do we stay? Mm Mm-hmm. I want you to want me more than you want your answer. Because Nate, I am your answer. I am the more that you're looking for. Your career, your calling, even if it's in ministry, Nate, it will not be enough for your soul, but I will. I am the more that you're looking for. We ended up moving, but that was a defining day for us. Too many times, 
I made fasting a back burner emergency 911 rather than a priority to say, God, more than anything else I'm doing, I need your presence. See, what happens is when you and I begin to fast and we begin to go after the presence of God, here's what's going to happen. He's going to give us answers. He's going to speak to us. And it's not going to be what we expected, but it is going to be what you and I need. The number one thing we need is God's presence. This is why Sabbath is tied in with fasting. In Isaiah chapter 58, this is what you see God doing. He combines fasting and Sabbath. These are not two uh, separate ideas. These are the way for God's people to live out the ways of God. And, and, and if we go, man, what, what is Sabbath? Here's the, the, the most simple way I can summarize what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath is this. It allows our souls to rest. The Sabbath is in the Ten Commandments. Also, this is what's interesting about the Sabbath. It's the longest, most explained piece of the Ten Commandments. And you know why? Because we don't know how to rest, do we? Because as the song goes, everybody's working for the what? Weekend, baby. Come on. Come on, Crossing family. Like you act like you haven't heard that song. You're like, we're, we're in the house of the Lord. We don't listen to that music. I'm calling you out, right? Everybody's working for the weekend, right? And this is what we're saying. We want, we want rest. We're hungry for rest. Some of you say this, though. Maybe your parents said this when you grew up. I'll rest when I'm what? Dead. We ain't resting. Can I tell you the quickest way for you to burn out? Don't rest. Just keep going. See, this is why Sabbath was so key. And you want to know why? See, the Ten Commandments wasn't something that God introduced so people could slap you on the hand with rulers for not keeping them. You know what it was? When the Israelites left Egypt after 400 years, they didn't know how to be human. You know how many days a week they worked? Seven, there was no rest. There was no delight. See, this is why you and I struggle, even pastors struggle with this idea. We become workaholics because here's what happens. It becomes our identity. Sabbath is a gift from God to say, I want you to rest in me. And don't you love it? He, I, I mean, it's one of those things, I can write a sermon, but you know what? Only God can make it 70 degrees in February when we're talking about Sabbath. You have no excuse to delight in the glory of God, right? To walk out and go, only you can do that, God. And here's what he's inviting you and I today to do is this. It's to simply delight, to make time to delight Maybe tonight, you and your family, you and your small group, man, you have a little campfire in your backyard and you, and you roast hot dogs and you come together. Yesterday, I played pickleball and I only won one game and I still delighted in it. Thank you very much, Corey, for humbling me game after game, right? But it's one of those things, man. It was just a delight. And here's what God's saying. It's this. He's going, work is not a curse. But here's what we need to understand. Our work is cursed. It's what happened in Genesis. He said, Adam, now you're going to work. And when you work, you're going to have thorns in your work. And not only that, he says this, you are going to, you're going to work by the sweat of your what? Brow. It doesn't mean that you're going to have hard work. What he's telling Adam is this, you are going to plant and guess what? Farmers in this room, you're going to plant. And does every season, do you get the fruit and the reward of everything you planted? No. And by the sweat of your brow, you're going to take the corn in and go, oh my goodness, I hope we can pay the bills this year. See, this is why we need rest. And we need rest for our souls. You know what I find amazing? It's this. This is why God wants to rearrange everything in our life. It's this. Did you realize that in the creation order, God, when he created on day six, he created man. And then on day seven, God what? He rested, which means this. The first thing that Adam experienced wasn't work, but what? Rest. It was rest. You know what the first thing Jesus said to the disciples after he rose, went to the cross and rose from the dead in John chapter 20, verse 19? You know what he said? The first thing he showed up, this is what he told them. Where'd you all go? No, he didn't. But wouldn't that be amazing, right? Like, like yeah, I like to write. They're locked in a room and they're, and, they're, and they're afraid. And you know what he says? The first thing he says to him is this. He shows up, the door's locked. He walks behind the door. And this is what he says to him. He says, peace be with you. 
You don't need to show a sign of hand or raise or anything, but I wonder how many people in this room and online today, that is your deepest need. You need the peace of God. And can I just encourage you with this? Rest is not found in your performance. Rest is not found in your personality. Rest is not found on how many connections you have or how much you have. Rest only comes from an empty tomb because this is what the creation order is. And you know what new creation begins with? It begins with the resurrected savior. See, your rest is not in you. Your rest is in Jesus. Matthew 12 says this. Pharisees were arguing about the Sabbath because they saw Jesus and his disciples walking through. And listen to what happens in Matthew chapter 12. It says, at that time, Jesus went throughout the grain fields on, his, on the Sabbath. And the disciples were hungry and they began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. You are not supposed to work at all. But the Pharisees, they lost the spirit of the commandment and said, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. You're making a sandwich. Verse eight, Jesus has to correct them and then he ends it with this. For the son of man is Lord of the what? Sabbath. You have no rest without Jesus. That mean all your problems are gonna go away. But the rest that your soul needs, the rest that you are longing for, the more that you're looking for is only found in Jesus. Here's the challenge for you and I this week that you're going to find. Here's the second challenge. Not only is it to find a 10-hour window this week to fast, the second one is this, that you and I would pick a day to Sabbath. How long has it been since you turned your phone off? Some of you just already started like, oh, 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 I I, I can't, I I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. How long has it been? See, the rest of Jesus isn't a reward. It's a gift. It's a gift that changes your work. It's a gift that goes into your family. It's a gift that goes into your soul. This is why Jesus says this in Matthew 11. He knows you and I are weary. He knows you and I are, are yearning for more. We're going after everything. And listen to what he says. He says, come to me. He doesn't say, get your life together. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You don't need to earn it. Then he goes on to say this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Walk with me, go pro with me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And he finishes by saying this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Jesus is telling them in Matthew 11, and he's telling you and I today, I am the more that you're looking for. Crossing family this week, may you feast with Jesus. May you rest in Jesus. And may your souls find the more that you're looking for. It's been an honor to be with you this weekend. We're moving to a time of decision. You know, I wonder how many people in this room right here, or for those of you who are watching online, if you were to be honest with yourself in this moment, in this invitation time, if you were to be honest with even me, just for, just for a moment of just complete transparency, but most importantly, if you were to be honest with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit who is working inside of you, who's so actively around this place, I wonder how many of you would say you are you're tired. You would say that when you walked into this room or you walked into the online space, you would say, I am carrying some heavy burdens. Not only are you carrying the burdens, but they are all around you. You, you didn't have enough hands to carry them all throughout this auditorium. They're, they're sitting on the chairs uh, underneath of you. They're sitting on the chair next to you. The burdens are so heavy and you are feeling so restless. But I want to remind you that last scripture where it says where the rest comes from, where those burdens can be laid. And it all comes and spurs out of an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, come to me. 
Come to me. Come to Jesus. Not me. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. And that, my friends, that is what this moment is all about. That's what this moment is designed for. For those of you not in this room, or for those of you in this room that don't have that relationship with Jesus, listen, you've never surrendered your life to him. You've never opened up your heart and you just said, hey, I'm going to... I'm going to be listening to your teaching. I'm going to be listening to your commandments. I want to be all about you. Listen, the burden that you brought into this room, the restlessness that you have right now is yours to carry. And you'll walk out of this room, you'll walk back into your life, and without a relationship with Jesus, you will continue to carry that. You will continue to feel weighted down. You will continue to feel tired. You will continue to feel weary. But that can change in a moment. It can change in this moment. As soon as you say with your whole life, with your whole heart, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and I want to give my life to Him. I want to trust in His name. I want to give my burdens to Him. He will take it. He will say, yes, You are my child and I will gladly take those burdens. I will gladly take the sins that you have and I will put them upon myself. When you come to this realization that God's way is the best way and you start walking out that relationship with him, there is something incredibly freeing in that moment. But I know that there's some or maybe even a lot of you You don't know what that feeling feels like. You don't know what that commitment looks like, more importantly. But today, you can say before you leave, I want to commit my life to Christ. I want to go pro in my faith. In just a little bit, the music's going to start playing. We're going to sing a couple songs. And it's an opportunity for you as as a person to declare that truth, that Jesus is your Savior. And you could accept him and you could walk in that relationship with him. And I'm going to be right up by the baptistry and I would love to help guide you and talk with you and pray with you and figure things out. What's your next step and how do you do that? You're like, I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Listen, I don't have all the answers, but Jesus does. But I would love to help guide you to him. He is the more that you're looking for. And I'm praying that you would take that decision serious today before you leave. For those of you in this room and online right now, you have that relationship with Christ and you, you're still fear, feeling tired. You, you're, feel, you're still feeling like you're carrying these heavy burdens. Those things don't go away, but I wonder if we got away from resting in the right places. That's what I love also about this time of invitation. It's a recentering. It's a time where we can just say, hey, I'm I have God's word, it's right in front of me, and I got to hear it. I had this opportunity to worship. Now I need to make sure I'm committed to his mission. And one of the ways you can do that, in just a little bit when the music starts for you, these steps are open as always. You hear this week in and week out, and I get it. Sometimes you're just like, that's not for me. That's somebody else. If I go forward, I think people are going to think I have all these problems, all these issues. They're going to think a lot of, it's not about that. Here's what these steps are about in these moments. It's about this, saying, hey, Spirit, I want to make room. I want to make room for you to do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. I, I know that I need to rest in your presence That's what this time is, is an opportunity for you to get down on your knees, for me to get down on my knees and to rest in his presence, to start feasting with Jesus. Maybe that moment starts right now for you and for me. If I had to share a conviction that I've been feeling over this last couple weeks, It's an interaction that I've been having with a lot of people or or, or people that I love. And and even you guys as my church family, you'll, you'll come up to me. And this, again, when I say this, this is nothing that you're doing. This is everything that I'm doing. But I'll have people come up to me and they'll say, hey, it'll start by this. They'll say, hey, Corey, I know you're busy, but hey, hey, Corey. Hey, I, know you're, I know you're busy, but I just need to, but you'll start off by saying that. And the reason that conviction is so strong on my heart is because, listen, I want people to fully see 
the Holy Spirit working in and through me. And I think that's what you want. You don't want someone coming up to you and just already saying, hey, I see you and you're always busy. You're always moving. You're always going to the next thing. And the reason that hurts and convicts me is because I believe when I do that, it's a reflection of me rushing through my moments with Jesus too. I feel like that's my personality. I'm going to rush through my Bible time. I'm going to rush through my prayer time. I got things to do rather than just resting and feasting with Jesus. That I want people to see the work of the Holy Spirit moving in and through me. And I think you want that too as Christians. So maybe this time is an invitation for you as a church family. As we continue to take steps to go pro together. What would it look like? What would it look like to have everybody in this room? I know that's going to be hard. There's not enough room. Where am I going to go? How can I do it? How can I make my way there? I got things I got to get to. But what would it look like as, as a church family, we just said, we're going to rest in his presence. We're going to get down on our knees and we're going to put everything else on pause. And we're going to say, Jesus, we're going to make room for you in this moment to do whatever you want to. I hope you'll join me in this time. Let's stand to our feet as we move to this time of invitation to come forward, to rest. Jesus, we love you. God, I thank you so much for a weekend such as this, for your word and for this message to hit in such a timely way. God, I pray that in this moment of response, in this moment of worship, you call us to, to do something about what we just heard, not to just sit on it, to put it into action. And Lord, I pray right now a tangible step, a tangible way to start resting in you, to start feasting with you, is to come in your presence, to lower ourselves before you, to cry out to you, to just say, Lord, I don't even know what you want me to do, and let you answer for us. Spirit, would you just move in this time? I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.